this video is going to uh, talk a little bit about what happens to materials when we put them under a uh, strain. Um, it's not always good. <laughs> that's, my, that's my little hint for you. Sometimes it is good, though. Sometimes it works out just fine. So uh, the first thing we're talking about is Poisson's ratio. So strain, we've talked mostly about uh, as changing, say, the length of a compressed rod or a, an extended rod. Um, but it does more than simply changing the length. And here we can see this compressed rubber uh, is expanding in the middle, right? If we um, pull it, it gets narrower in the middle. We push it down, it's going to expand uh, horizontally. Um, this uh, is a matter of basically forcing more material into a smaller space, right? We'd expect this to happen. I push this down, um, you know, I've got a smaller distance between here and here. I have the same amount of mass, uh, and so the tendency is going to be for that object to sort of uh, to expand horizontally. Um, and we can quantify that by what's called Poisson's ratio. You might think you could just calculate it, right, by doing a little volume, like how much is, uh, how much, uh, is the volume uh, of the original rod. Um, now it's a different height, and so the area of it um, throughout the rod must be, you know, different. Um, but it's not that simple because you're actually compressing the molecular structure uh, and the microstructure of these materials, and so they're going to expand horizontally uh, in different ways. In other words, the density of the material is actually changing, so the volume isn't staying the same. Uh, but Poisson's uh, ratio looks like this. It's usually uh, signified by uh, this guy here. Uh, and so we look at the strain, the lateral strain. In other words, how much have we compressed uh, our object here? And that's going to uh, tell us something about the longitudinal strain. So you can see how we might do a test of this, right? We take a, an object and we compress it to get a certain amount of strain. We measure how much uh, it's uh, changed longitudinally, uh, and we can find Poisson's ratio. It tends to be a value uh, somewhere about 0 0.4, 0 0.3 or 0 0.4 uh, for a lot of metals, but for other objects it can be really um, uh, interestingly different. Uh, and in fact, there are even some negative Poisson ratio, um, which is weird, right? You know, you compress something and it might... Um, and it might actually get narrower horizontally. Uh, but those are pretty rare. Uh, for the most part, it's going to be uh, in that area between a quarter and a third. So that's Poisson's ratio. Uh, and that, that uh, again, a material characteristic. Steel is going to have a certain ratio, and uh, aluminum will have another one. Okay, so strain... Um, can actually change the material structure of a material. Uh, and this has to do with uh, the difference between elastic and plastic um, strain. So in elastic strain here, we know that it bounces back and goes back to the original state when uh, something is strained elastically. And that's because elastic strain is about um, interatomic stresses and, and structure. So I'm going to, you know, in a, say a metal, I've got some a structure of atoms in there. They're at a nice equilibrium point. And then, say, I put them under strain. I, I uh, compress those. Those atoms are pushed closer together. They don't want to be closer together. So they push back, right? And I let go and stop compressing the material. And they go back to their nice equilibrium point. Um, so that's elastic strain. That's all has to do with, uh, with interatomic forces. Plastic strain that is the strain that's happening past the yield point up here, um, is a result of changes in the microstructure of your material. And microstructure is bigger than your atomic structure. It's the, the arrangement of crystals uh, and, uh, and, and, and structure within uh, a material. And that crystal structure has irregularities in it. And those irregularities actually make a material more stiff um, because they actually, if you have the start of some plastic change, a new irregularity will actually stop that. 
What happens when we strain something plastically is we create more of these irregularities in the crystal structure. Um, and so if I bend a, a metal um, in the, into the plastic range, it's messing up those crystals in there, creating irregularities, which are like little speed bumps. Uh, and then the next time, say I then re release that from stress, the next time I try and bend it, there are more microstructure irregularities in there that try to stop any kind of plastic change. Um, and so by strain hardening something, by putting something under strain, we actually make it a stiffer uh, material than it was before. That's pretty crazy, right? It's kind of cool. Um, and you've actually changed the microstructure of a particular material. That's what, that's the idea of strain hardening. We put something under strain, it's going to make it a stiffer material. It's going to make its yield point higher. So in the material's new form, the atomic forces remain the same. And so E remains the same. You can see here, here's E and there's E. So that process I talked about before, here we strain, we start here, we strain something elastically, we let go, it goes back here. Right? We strain something again. We go past the yield point. I'm straining it plastically now. I'm adding those uh, microstructural irregularities in there. Um, it spring, I let go. It springs back. The inner atomic stresses spring back and bring me back here. Right? So I'm actually at a different, it's permanently longer. That's my plastic change there. But then the next time I try to strain it or put it under stress, it actually is going to go much higher in terms of stress before it starts to yield. That's the stiffness that I've added uh, through strain hardening. So that microstructure can now accept a larger stress without changing further. And so the yield strength is larger. The problem with this is we've now got a stiffer material, but we have a plastic region that is going to be smaller. In other words, it's not going to it's not going to make our fracture point any larger. So we have a stiffer material that's more likely once we reach the yield point is more likely to actually fracture. And so that strain hardened material uh, is stiffer, but it's more brittle. There's not going to be as much plastic change. Uh, available when we actually reach that yield strength. And sometimes we want a, uh, a really stiff material that we're not worried too much about brittleness. Sometimes we want a plastic material that we know that if we go past the yield point, it's not going to break immediately. So strain hardening can be both desirable or undesirable depending on the situation. That brings us to the issue of failure, um, and I want to talk broadly here about some of the different kinds of failure uh, that we can run into. Strain ultimately leads to fracture, right? In a brittle material, uh, failure can be quick and catastrophic. That's why a brittle material is oftentimes very stiff, that maybe we want that, right? But once it starts to yield, it may break very quickly. And that can be a, a major problem depending upon what that material is in. So that's one type of failure, fracture, right? A ductile material, that is this sort of classic diagram with a large plastic region, uh, a local stress might result in plastic deformation and strain hardening. And that can be really good, right? Uh, say we want, you know, we plan for it not to reach the yield strength, but then say one, there's some a stress concentration, there's a little bit of plastic uh, of yield, um, but then the material just stretches a little bit, changes plastically. It's a little more brittle than it was before, but it didn't fail uh, catastrophically. And, and that's one reason that a ductile material can be really useful. In fact, that can be part of a design using a material, figuring that over time there's going to be some plastic change to this material that's actually going to make it stiffer. 
But for ductile materials, we can also get failures that happen at stress levels below where we might normally think they would happen. Right? So that stress strain diagram is going to say, oh, it's not going to fail until we get to that failure uh, stress. But there are some other ways that we can see uh, ductile materials failing, uh, notably by fatigue or by creep. Now these are two different things, and so we want to talk about how those are different. Uh, creep occurs when a material is under stress for a long period of time. So we look at this telephone pole here, and it's got probably a stress pulling it this way to the left, and that stress is probably well below its yield stress. But you can see that the telephone pole has started to bend. Um, this is because that, uh, that low stress is being applied uh, over a long period of time. And so you get a creeping change uh, to the shape of that. You get plastic deformation even though the stress never reaches the plastic region. It never goes beyond the yield strength. For metals, this mostly happens at high temperatures. Um, and so creep is measured at a particular temperature with a defined limit uh, to the strain. And so a plot like this here shows the number of hours, which is down on the x-axis, required uh, to meet this limit under a different stress level. So you can see down here it says, okay, at 1200 degrees Fahrenheit, um, for stainless steel here, we're going to look at how many um, hours at a particular stress level do we need to apply this before we get a 1% creep strain? Okay, so if it, you know, or say our yield strength here might be, you know, 60 or 80. You know, so at 40, we're going to see not that long before we see some creep strain. Uh, at lower levels of stress, you know, say down here at 25 or something, we might say that takes, oh, it's 600 hours or 1,000 hours. And you can see there's a limit here where stresses below 20 aren't going to cause any kind of creep. Okay? So this is a function of time, it's a function of temperature, and it's a function of stress. So there's a lot going on here when we talk about creep. Fatigue, on the other hand, doesn't happen when we have a constant load. It happens when we have a load that's repeatedly applied and removed. And this happens all the time, right? We think about a, this uh, drill head here. Uh, the stress on this rod as this pulls up and down on uh, this cord here. Um, you're going to apply that load, then you're going to remove that load. You're going to apply that load, and you're going to remove it. And so here we want to talk about iterations, and that's what that N is in this plot and the number of iterations that a, a material can go under a particular load and have it removed before it starts to experience uh, fatigue. Uh, and so let's look at our plot here. We have two different materials. Let's look at steel because it's a little more conventional. Um, we can say, okay, if I apply a load of 40,000 uh, pounds per square inch, um, I don't have to apply it very often before I get some plastic um, strain, right? But if I, um, you know, apply a load closer to say 28 here, which is um, below the yield strength, I will get some yield if I apply it. You know, oh, this is times 10 to the six. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was looking at that thinking, why? Wait. So yeah, it's here. You know, this is a million loads, right? Um, at 30, you actually start to see some fatigue. Um, this is probably what? 3 million, 4 million uh, iterations. You see some at 28. Uh, and then it levels off here, which is uh, typical here for steel. But the idea is you get a change in, um, in the, the microstructure of your material just by applying a load over and over and over, even if that load is below the yield strength. And so the endurance limit expresses uh, material's ability to withstand those kinds of repeated loads. And we talked about this plot a little bit here, so you can spend a little bit of time and make sure you understand what's going on here. In this case, we might say uh, that 
steel has an endurance limit of 27, right? Because no matter how many times we apply a load under 27, we're never going to cause fatigue in that steel. If we go above 27, we have to start counting our iterations and thinking about what's going to happen to that, uh, that material over a long period of time. So that's creep and fatigue. <laughs> you feel those in your own lives, you know, it's just like stress. All of this applies to, uh, to all of us.